Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is focused on ensuring accurate classification of variants in BRC1, BRC2 and HRR genes. Next slide, please. Um, we welcome you very much, um, along with myself, Sandy Deans, who's the director of GenQA, and my colleague, Simon Patton, who's the CEO of EMQM. We've got a couple of housekeeping rules just to start before we start um, and hand on with the presentations from our experts today. Um, your microphone has been automatically muted just because there's many people on the call and to avoid background noise. We've also recorded this webinar for um, purposes for you um, to be able to review and listen to it after the event. And also, this is very much an interactive session. It's educational, but we also want some input and to actually respond to your questions. So please use the Q&A function um, to submit your questions on the, um, the Zoom call, and we will answer them hopefully at the end of the dedicated Q&A session, which follows our expert presentations today. Next slide, please. Okay, as I mentioned, these really are educational webinars, a series that we're putting together in 2022, and we want to make sure that they're actually fit for purpose and actually fulfil your needs. So your feedback is incredibly important to us, and it does help us to continue to provide this high quality training to the healthcare professionals globally. So you'll receive an email after this masterclass to a link to a short feedback survey and we would really appreciate if you could just take a couple of minutes of your time to complete the survey. We do review the feedback and adapt the content of the webinars accordingly. Next slide please. So let's kick off with today's webinar. As I mentioned, um, myself and Simon will be chairing and we're joined today by three um, members of our expert panel who are in heavily involved in delivering the external quality assessments for classification of variants. And also today we are going to provide um, some educational feedback on using databases, applying the guidelines um, and really starting to help you how you can implement classification in a standardised form in your own clinical service. So next slide, please. Quick disclaimer. Thank you. And moving on again. OK, so we have three expert reviewers today to join us. We start with um, Dr. Andrew Morani, who is based in Edmonton in Canada, um, so has a very early start to join us on this live webinar. Um, he um, works within the Alberta Health Services and is a clinical molecular geneticist with extensive experience in the interpretation of cancer variants, and he joined the EQA team last year. And Andrew's going to give us a general overview of the variant classification guidelines that are currently exist. Then we move on to Miranda Durkee. So Miranda has, um, is a lead clinical scientist for rare diseases at Sheffield Diagnostic Genetic Service here in the UK. Um, and Miranda's really been instrumental in the CANVIG work um, and is author of the also the 2022 guidelines. So is an expert person to come and talk to us today um, around the classification codes, um, how to use them and when to use them and give us some insight into the actual application of the guidelines. And then finally, we've Professor Kathleen Kloss from Ghent in Belgium. Kathleen has a wealth of experience in cancer predisposition and precision oncology, and again has heavily involved in the Enigma working groups on the international stage. So again, very well placed to help um, today give us a, a great overview of this, um, this ability to accurately classify the variants. So I'm now going to move on. So next slide, please, and hand you over to the safe hands of Andrew, who is going to um, start us off with our presentations. Andrew, over to you, please. Thank you for that introduction. Sorry, here we go. All right, so um, this slide just shows uh, the different guidelines that people have are using for these uh, schemes. So the options we have are the ACMG 2015 only, the ACMG 2015 and ACGS 2020, or the ACMG 2015, 
ACGS 2020 and Canada UK. Uh, almost half of the individuals registered for this scheme use the ACMG 2015 only, and then the remainder use uh, one of the other combinations, including other. So in 2015, the ACMG and AMP um, published the standards and guidelines for variant interpretation. And this set the foundation for standardizing variant interpretation across uh, not only the country, but I guess across the world for clinical labs. Um, I apologize, I'm reading that the sound is not great. Uh, please let me know if this is getting better. So after the 2015 guidelines were published, there were a number of other consensus statements and guidelines that came out from groups such as the ACGS and the BCGS. Um, there are several best practice guidelines that came out, uh, as well as from the Canvig UK group. So some considerations to keep in mind when reviewing uh, variant interpretation. Uh, the first is the term mutation and polymorphism, because they are somewhat ambiguous, they should not be used and have been replaced with the term variant. Variant can be classified into five different categories, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, uncertain significance, likely benign and benign. These recommendations are intended to determine whether a variant in a gene that already, uh, already has a definitive role in the Gillian disorder, whether this var uh, variant may be pathogenic for that particular disorder. Pathogenicity determination should be independent of interpreting the cause of disease in a given patient. Uh, which means uh, an example of this is if you have a large panel that you're looking at, it is possible to find a pathogenic variant in an individual that does not necessarily explain the disease for that individual. The mechanism of disease is important to consider when evaluating a variant. Not all variants, not all genes uh, are loss of function. Some are gain of function uh, genes, such as rosopathies. Uh, these guidelines do not work great for somatic and mitochondrial variants, which have uh, some special additional considerations to keep in mind. And variants of uncertain significance should not be used for clinical decision making. Uh, one point I did not mention here uh, is these guidelines work best for highly penetrant disorders. When the penetrance uh, decreases, a lot of the evidence you're evaluating for variant classification becomes a lot more tricky to interpret. Next slide, please. I don't see, thank you. Uh, variant, classific variant classification information can be broken down into several different uh, categories of evidence such as population data, computational predictive data, functional data, segregation data, and allelic data. The majority of this, these classes of evidence have both benign and pathogenic uh, leading evidences, with the exception of de novo data. De novo only has evidence that leads towards pathogenicity, not to benign. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide. It's this, it, it lists all the evidence in the 2015 uh, Richard, Al, Richard et al. publication for um, variant classification. Uh, but what I just wanted to point out with this is uh, the evidence can be broken down into, on the pathogenicity side, very strong, strong, moderate, and supporting. And on the benign side, standalone, strong, and supporting. The other thing I wanted to point out is you can probably notice from the list of these tables that there are more pieces of evidence that can be used to point towards pathogenicity than there is towards benign. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So final variant classification. So final classification of a variant. Uh, once you've identified all the evidence you can for a variant, uh, what you do is add up the different points of evidence and the strengths, and then uh, you determine whether it adds up to being a pathogenic change, a likely pathogenic change, benign or likely benign, or of uncertain significance. Next slide, please. So this was a great start for variant classification and gave a lot of information. But after the publication of this, there are several other publications and guidelines that came out to uh, help give more information for this. And one such publication is uh, the modeling of these ACMG guidelines into a Bayesian classification framework, which came out in 2018. And what essentially they did is they took the strengths of evidence from the 2015 guidelines and followed a Bayesian model to try to quantify the evidence used. And what they were able to do is with this, find a pattern that fit the evidence and also came up with uh, three new uh, variant uh, classification uh, combinations that led to likely pathogenic, pathogenic, and uncertain significant classifications. Next slide, please. Uh, another uh, important publication that came out subsequent to the 2015 guidelines is a in-depth um, review of the PBS1 uh, variant criterion. And what this publication did is they looked at the PBS1 evidence and they broke it down into five different categories. And I'm not going to go through the whole decision tree that's on the left here, but working through one example from a previous scheme. And uh, so from this scheme that happened a couple cycles ago, it was a BRCA1 5561 Dell. Uh, this is a frame shift variant, so it would follow the first scheme, uh, first uh, point in the decision tree. It's a non shifter frame, sh it's a non sense of frame shift. Uh, this variant occurs in the last exon, so it's not predicted to undergo non sense mediated decay. Uh, the functional role of this protein region is unknown, and less than 10% of the protein is affected. So we end up with a PVS1 moderate strength. Uh, next slide, please. Another publication that came out is a deep dive into the PS3, BS3 criterion. So this is the use of functional evidence for classification of a variant. And this publication goes through how to evaluate uh, the the relevance of a particular assay for your gene or variant of interest, how to evaluate whether the assay was performed appropriately with the correct number of controls, and ultimately how to apply the evidence for your particular variant of interest. Next slide, please. Um, since the 2015 guidelines, there have been a number of other updated um, sequence variant interpretation recommendations. Not all of them were published in the literature, but they all can be found on the uh, QuinGen website. Next slide, please. Uh, one of such is the QuinGen recommendations for PM2. It was recommended that PM2 be downgraded from a moderate strength of evidence to a supporting strength of evidence, uh, partly because it was found that in the exact database, over 54% of high quality variants were only seen once in the entire data set. So this suggests that being a rare variant is not a rare occurrence and therefore the strength of this evidence is not, should not be so high. However, by decreasing the weight of this criterion, uh, they also recommended the change of allowing PVS1 and one supporting strength of evidence to also be considered lucky than that. Next slide, please. 
Another uh, such recommendation is how to use the in-trans criteria or PM3. Uh, considerations to use for this include allele frequency, phasing, classification, and uh, homozygous occurrences. And essentially what you do with this is um, there's a scoring criteria based on the, the strength of the in-trans pathogenic, the in-trans variant you're seeing the variant with, how many times it occurs, uh, and whether it's confirmed phase or not. And then you add up your points and then there's a second table where you can figure out which strength of evidence you should use for this. Next slide, please. Uh, there are also several ClinGen uh, gene or disorder specific guidelines that were created by separate working groups, which can also be found on the ClinGen website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of such is uh, a fairly recent one for the ATM gene. And what's useful about these guidelines is they are based on the 2015 ACMG guidelines, but they were refined for the gene of interest. So for ATM, they've established better BA1 and BS1 criteria, uh, as well as which rules do not apply for this gene of interest, such as BS2. Um, and so they're very useful in taking out the guessing work for uh, applying the ACMG guidelines to the ATM gene or whichever gene of interest uh, the guidelines are made for. Next slide, please. So at the same time that the CANVIG, the Cancer Variant Interpretation Group UK, uh, worked on their own set of guidelines, which is modeled off the ACMG guidelines. Uh, however, these guidelines, as they're set for cancer genes, they, they did give a little more detail than the general 2015 ACMG guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these guidelines are very useful because they took out a lot of the guessing work, uh, as did the ClinGen gene-specific guidelines but they established exactly what would constitute for, so for this example, for PM2, how to score when to use PM2. So whether it's zero or one alleles in greater than 50,000 individuals. So they, they took out a lot of the ambiguity in some of the ACMG guideline uh, recommendations. Next slide, please. Uh, Canvig UK also has several gene-specific guidelines, uh, such as for SDHB, for MMR genes, and for BRCA1 and 2. Next slide, please. Uh, these recommendations are also very useful because, like the ATM guidelines from uh, ClinVar, these spell out exactly uh, which criteria can and cannot be used for the BRCA1 and 2 genes and what the thresholds that you should be using are and even which functional evidence uh, is useful for the classification of these variants. I'm also told that uh, Enigma and ACMG will be releasing their own BRCA1 and 2 gene-specific guidelines, but I'm not sure when this will be coming out. And I believe that's the end of my section. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, very much. And I think some of the sound was coming and going, but we, we heard most of it there. So thank you for doing that very much indeed. Um, we're now going to move on to our second speaker, Miranda Durkee, who is going to give um, a, a whirlwind educational um, review of ACMG codes, how and when to use them. So Miranda, I'm going to hand over to you now, please. Lovely. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you very much to Andrew as well for that great overview. Um, yeah, hopefully everyone could hear okay. And, and obviously this is all recorded, so you can go back to the slides as well. 
So the reason that we thought we would focus on the ACMG codes is actually from feedback from you from previous runs, that for those of us that are very familiar with the codes and start talking about PVS1, PM1, PS1, um, it can sound like a foreign language to those of you that are just learning what these codes are. So we thought we'd really take some time and go through each code and um, or, or the main ones that are very specific to cancer susceptibility and uh, some of the nuances or cautions of kind of when not you know when to use them and when not to use them and I'm going to mainly concentrate on the CAMVIG guidelines and um, one because um, I'm very heavily involved in that but also they're the most up-to-date and as Andrew said they are what they are designed specifically for the cancer susceptibility genes um, so just one final thing to say is that there are a few codes that I've included slides for, but we don't use them very often. And just for the sake of time, I don't want you know everyone to fall asleep. So um, I'm going to skip over a few slides, but yeah, you can always go back to this recording. So I hope everyone's got a strong coffee and we'll get stuck in. So I've grouped the codes um, into, uh, into kind of areas into how you would use them. So the first kind of group is computational and predictive data. So this means that we don't have any experimental data for that variant, but we can use information about the type of variant or maybe some computational tools to predict what the effect on the protein is going to be. So I'm going to look at the, both the pathogenic and the benign criteria. So we're going to start with PVS1 and in the original Richards et al paper PVS1 was the only code that you could use at a very strong strength so it's a very very useful code to use in order to get your variant to likely pathogenic or pathogenic and it is to be used for null alleles and by null we mean where there's no protein produced so you've got um, nonsense mediated decay for example a nonsense a frame shift a canonical splice variant initiation codon or a cnv and yeah obviously in a gene where loss of function is no mechanism of, di of disease which is for the majority of the cancer susceptibility genes so as Andrew said, please use the PBS1 decision tree. It, you know, it really is good. Um, and um, also there's another kind of similar tree in the ACGS 2020 guidelines for the stop loss variants. So for the rest of this slide, I'm now going to focus on some of the complexities and when you either shouldn't use PBS1 or you should be very cautious about using PBS1 because this can really trip people up. So the first one, the first caution is that truncating variants in either the last exon of the gene or the penultimate 50 ba base pairs of the, of the penultimate exon do not result in NMD. So you will get a, a protein translated and that protein may be functional. So a good example of this is in run four, we included their classic BRCA2 benign variant, P.lysine 3326 stop. And for that variant, you really would not um, uh, use PBS1 because we know that area of the gene is not conserved and that is a very kind of common variant in the population. On a very similar theme, also truncating variants in the first 100 base pairs of the gene may not be subject to nonsense mediated decay because you can get reinitiation from another in frame methionine. So a good example of that, we've not included it in the scheme yet, but is RAD51C. You can get a P dot lysine for nonsense um, mutation. And again, you've got an in-frame of thionine at code on 10. So it would not be a good idea to use PBS1 for that variant. Then, as Andrew um, also mentioned, you can get frame shift variants at the end of the gene that cause a protein extension, which may not be subject to nonsense mediated decay. So this example that um, Andrew already mentioned was in run six and caused a lot of problems in classification um, and is already shown that using the PBS1 decision tree, we would score that as PBS1 moderate. However, you also need to check whether there is a termination codon in the 3' UTR, because if there isn't one, then you get a different mechanism called non-stop decay, and you therefore would get a, a null allele, and therefore you would apply PBS1 at very strong. So next, moving on to some splicing variants. And splicing variants can be very hard to predict. So you can get variants that lead to an in-frame deletion. So for example, this BRCA2 minus 2 A to G variant causes a deletion of exon 12. 
that's an in-frame deletion, but more importantly, we know that that exon is functionally redundant in BRCA2 and therefore is not required for normal protein function and therefore PVS1 would not be applicable in that case. So don't just apply PVS1 if you see a you know, plus or minus one or two. Then there are also splice variants where you can get an alternative in-frame cryptic splice site. So a good example is the BRCA1 C.301 plus 1 G to A. And this has been shown by RNA studies to cause a three amino acid deletion. So again, PVS1 really isn't the appropriate code to use here. And you'd be more um, wanting to use PM4, which is for in-frame insertions and deletions. Then, this is a really interesting group, these splice variants where you get no alteration predicted. And these are all plus two T to C variants that can create a functional GC site. So in the ATM guidelines that Andrew's just mentioned, there's actually six of these variants that they've used splice AI to check to see whether that um, splice site it does create, um, uh, is functional or not. And they've decided that PVS1 should not be applied in those cases. So yeah, really recommend Splice AI as a good tool for those. And then we also have CMVs. And CMVs, you can think it's a large deletion, it's going to be pathogenic, but again, they can create um, a small, small in-frame deletions. So for example, in run six, we had a BRCA2 exon 14 to 16 deletion. Using the PVS decision tree, that would come out as PVS1 moderate, but we were able to upgrade it to strong because the region was critical to protein function. So a good tip for that is to look for any known pathogenic missense variants in that region. And obviously, please check that they're not acting on splicing. So that was a really kind of quick few examples of when PVS1 could not be kind of so straightforward and you really need to take care in applying it. Um, but there's a fantastic presentation on the CAMVIG um, website under the resources section that was done by James Drummond that's got absolutely loads more examples where PVS1 um, can create problems and certainly shouldn't be used at very strong strength. Okay, so next I'm going to move on to PM1 and PP2, which I've grouped together. PP2 are grayed out because it's for a, a gene constraint that we very, very rarely use in cancer susceptibility. PM1 is used where there's a regional constraint and the CAMVI guidelines, we would use it at moderate for these critically important residues in the ring, BRCT or DNA binding domain. And we would use PM1 supporting for other residues in those domains. I thought a good example to use um, for this um, code is that in run six, we had a BRCA1 missense variant, PDOC glycine 1788 asparagine. And 30% of participants used both PM1 and moderate and PM5 moderate together. Anyone that's very eagle eyed will have noticed that uh, 1788 isn't in the list on the right of those key critical domains. So we would only use it as supporting, but also PM1 is saying it's a hotspot. And then PM5 is saying you have other pathogenic variants at that same codon. So they're kind of equivalent. They're saying the same thing. So you really would be over counting that piece of evidence to use it twice, particularly two moderates. So the CAMBI guidelines, we don't allow these codes to be used together. Uh, on PM4 is the in-frame insertion solutions, and this is one of the ones I'm skipping over. Um, moving on to PM5, which I've just mentioned. So this is where you find a missense change, and there's been another pathogenic missense change reported at that same codon. And based on work that's been published by the CAMVI group, um, looking at the... Um, a Findlay assay, then we would use it at moderate if the variant you're looking at has a more deleterious REVEL score than the previously reported pathogenic variant. However, we would use it at supporting if either you've got a less deleterious REVEL score or it's been reported um, as lightly pathogenic in another, in another patient or only been reported in one individual. Basically, it's best to err on the side of caution because you know, patients can have a very life-changing treatment on the basis of these results. So um, uh, a good example from this is from uh, run four, we had a BRCA1 missense variant, PDOT3-anine-1691-alanine. 
On the Findlay et al. assay, you know, a very, very good um, functional assay, there were four loss of function missense variants at this codon. There was one missense functional variant, and the variant that we asked you to uh, analyze was actually intermediate on the assay. So we wouldn't use PS3 for this variant, but we could apply PM5. The Revel score was significantly um, or was lower than the others, but above 0.7, which is our cutoff. So on to PP3, which is for the in silico tools or the multiple lines of computational evidence. And you've got two types of evidence you can apply here. The first is for the impact on the uh, on the protein. And there have been quite a few publications showing now that use of multiple tools is no longer recommended because it can introduce significant bias. You can uh, choose which, which programs you like or which ones you kind of want to make the answer that, that, you, um, that you want. Um, so it's much better to use something like a really well validated meta predictor such as Rebel, and we would use a cutoff of greater than 0.7. For splicing, as I mentioned before, Splice AI is a fantastic tool, um, but for anyone using um, Alima, as shown in the screenshot here, then um, using Maxent Scan or Splice um, Site Binder like um, are also kind of recommended. And this is just showing an example from Run 4, where this minus 3 C to G variant, pretty much you lose the natural acceptor site and you get creation of a cryptic site. And I just really quickly wanted to highlight that there is a preprint now available from the ClinGen SVI looking at PP3 and BP4. And they have done lots of work that actually um, supports previous work that we've published via Canvig to show that some of the tools can be used at higher strength. So for example, Revel can potentially be used at strong for PP3 and at very strong for BP4. So we have not incorporated this into guidelines yet, but watch this space because I would say this is um, likely to be coming when this paper is you know, published and out. So another code that um, uh, can cause problems and we've already received some questions about is BP1. So this is a missense variant in a gene for which primarily truncating variants are known to cause disease. And there are two good uses of this. First, for genes where the vast majority of reported pathogenic mutations are truncating. So a good example is PALB2. Um, or the other usage is for gene cold spots. We often kind of talk about hot spots, but there are also cold spots of genes. So this, a good example of this would be missense variants in BRCA1 or BRCA2 that are outside of those key domains and they're not conserved. Um, and by um, that, we just really want to check the conservation to ensure it's not highly conserved and it's not something that's to do with, you know, a very key structural um, amino acid or something. Um, but generally, it's, it's fairly obvious when you can see it's not very well concerned outside of those domains, and you can apply BP1 at supporting. Uh, and a caveat, please remember to exclude splicing. So onto the other computational tools, um, which is BP4, um, the opposite PP3 for the multiple lines of computational evidence. And then we also have the BP7, which is for a synonymous or a silent change. And here you also have to look at the splicing, but you also have to check that the nucleotide is not highly conserved. Um, so again, the same tools as before. Um, a little caveat that um, some of the kind of older tools aren't so good at looking at the things like the GC donor splice site or the minor splice zone, the Splice AI does work really well for those. Um, and then uh, also a note that in the ACGS guidelines, um, uh, it was a few versions ago, I think maybe 2018, we allowed the use of both BP4 and BP7 together for synonymous changes so that you could get them to um, a class two rather than keeping them all at class three. Okay, phew, that was kind of um, a big section, but now we're on to functional um, data. So now it's just um, the PS3 and BS3. Uh, and the key thing here, so this is PS3 means you've got a well-established in vitro or in vivo functional study supporting a damaging effect. And um, as uh, Andrew has already said, um, that we've got these fantastic Brinich guidelines out. And before that, it was really hard to work out whether your assay was well established, was it good enough? So that really takes you through a framework of how to tell whether the, the assay meets the kind of you know, minimum standards. And then the statistical analysis based on the numbers of true and false um, positives and negatives. We would recommend if the variant comes up as intermediate, you do not use the evidence tool because you don't know if that's intermediate due to the assay or intermediate due to the variant. 
And actually in cancer susceptibility, we're now very lucky that we have multiple of these very large multiplex assays. And so we need to consider how to use the evidence um, from different assays, particularly if it's conflicting. So just to highlight another useful tool on the CAMVIG um, website in the top right hand corner, and um, you click this button saying functional study scoring. It brings you up an XLS with all the main functional studies have all been analyzed and assessed by the Greenwich guidelines for you. And um, it shows you um, what strength you can use, um, but all the kind of information and statistics, et cetera, is provided. And also in the guidelines, because this is from the consensus guidelines, we've got a couple of tables showing how you combine the evidence. So a good example of this is back in uh, run four, we had this P dot um, isoleucine 68 to lysine in BRCA1. And it, that was found to be loss of function on both the Finley et al uh, assay and the Sterita et al assay. So we know that we can use PS3 at strong, um, but at that time, less than 22% of participants use PS3 and 70% of participants scored this variant as a VUS rather than a likely pathogenic, which obviously has significant implications um, for that variant. So this run was, uh, was before the Brinich guidelines came out. So hopefully this is now improving as people are aware of them. Um, so that the Brinich covers really well the protein assays, but does not go into splicing at all. So there is a ClinGen SBI group looking at splicing, but there are no guidelines available as yet. So meanwhile, you just have to be very careful to make sure that the um, assay that you're looking at is well established and is a good quality assay. So some of the things to think about, has it been independently replicated? Have they used sufficient normal controls? If you detect an abnormal isoform, is that isoform naturally occurring? And is the splice effect leaky? So that means, do you get some wild type protein from that mutant allele? And so in the CAMVIG consensus guidelines, we have a grid showing um, yeah, you the strength um, that you can use, PS3 for the splicing assays, depending on all of those um, things. And um, a good example here, um, where we had two orthogonal splicing assays confirming out of frame transcripts. So we know we can be confident that we can apply PS3 at very strong. PS3, I'm going to skip over for the sake of time, opposite to um, PS3, really. And move on to population data. And I know this causes um, a lot of questions and um, can be quite a complex area. So hopefully you're going to find this uh, helpful. So in the original Richards et al paper, the PS4 code was really designed to be used for case control studies where the prevalence of the variant in affected individuals was significantly increased compared to the prevalence in controls. But unfortunately, it's very rare to get case control as, um, studies in cancer susceptibility. So the majority of the published VSETs have gone for this case counting approach, certainly used by the TP53 and the P10 um, VSETs. And it's particularly useful where you've got quite a specific patient phenotype, and then they would not use that PP4 um, uh, phenotype code. The advantage of it is, is that you don't need to know the total number of tests required. You don't need a big ca you know, case control study. Um, and so in the CAMVI guidelines, we've said if there is insufficient data to perform case control analyses, then we can you can apply PS4 as supporting only. So being quite cautious because of the how common breast cancer is in the population, but you can apply it as supporting if there are five or more observations of that variant in families with a family history of um, a, a hereditary breast or ovarian cancer and the variant is also rare or absent from nomad i.e you can apply pm2 which i'm going to come on to in a minute so the other option which works beautifully and um, if you've got the data is that we can actually do the case control um, approach by using kind of data that all the NHS labs now have been submitting data to NHS Digital and NHS Digital have given that data back to the CAMBAR UK database so uh, anyone can um, access that data. We are due an update very soon so we're hoping that the number of counts are going to pretty much double. And you can just use this very simple um, calculation called the Fisher's exact test to look at your cases with a breast or ovarian cancer, how many times you've seen that variant, how many were wild type, and then compare it to the controls, which we would use NOMAD for. So a quick worked example is um, this is the cases, and this is again from the Canva UK website. 
We've seen this variant in the UK 18 times in um, over 22,000 um, total tests, and it's not seen at all in NOMAD. Um, before that we did this um, analysis, this variant was actually classified by most labs as a VUS. But you can see this data is very convincing. We get a very significant p-value, and we can use PS4 at a very strong level in order to um, uh, push that from the VUS up to pathogenic. Okay, so now on to PM2, which is rare in controls. And it was originally intended to be absent from controls, um, but from the ESP and the, and the 1000 GNs project. So um, obviously we now have Nomad and much bigger data sets. Um, uh, so in, as Andrew said, in 2020, the ClinGen SVI recommended that we downgraded PM2 to supporting only but caveated that they anticipated that there would be adjustments in the relative weight of other, um, evidence, um, other evidence codes in order to accommodate that change. So the ACGS and CANBIG together agreed that as we'd done a preliminary um, look at some of our variants and that a significant number, particularly missense ones, would be affected and actually would move classification from likely pathogenic to VUS, that we would hold on for these um, other ACNG guidelines in order to balance this change. So the CANVA guidelines are quite stringent. We do allow the use of moderate, but only where there are zero um, um, observations. So it has to be completely absent from NOMAD. And then we would use it as supporting where the variant is not absent, but it's a very low frequency. So we'd say 0.002%. Um, and that's an example for um, PALB2. Oh, and yeah, just to say that for the primarily BRCA and ovarian cancer genes, we'd recommend looking at the female non-cancer cohort in NOMAD. So on to BA1 and BS1. So BA1 is the only code that you can use as a standalone to say it's really high in controls and that variant is obviously benign. Whereas BS1 is a strong code just if that is too frequent in controls and then what you'd expect. And there is this fantastic tool that was developed by Nikki Whiffin um, at AL and it's um, located at CardioDB allele frequency app. And this can be used to calculate your maximum tolerated allele frequency for the variant in a control population such as NOMAD. It can seem a little bit complicated, but the good news is, is that you don't need to do this because actually all that work has been done for you. So there, again, on the CANVIG website under resources, there's a presentation on the application of the different thresholds, the BA1, BS1, and plus worked examples for the BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and plus the Lynch genes. So I've included um, some of the calculations here. I'm not going to go through it, but um, we calculated that you could use um, BA1 standalone if the mine, um, if the maximum tolerated allele frequency is greater than 0.1% and for BS1 strong at 0.01%. But you don't want to kind of get that data directly from NOMAD because there is another calculation that looks at your Gaussian distribution. So um, you can either go to NOMAD and go to the top left hand side where it says your pop max and um, allele frequency, but that's just based on one population um, alone. Or you can go to the CardioDB um, website and go to this tab here that says calculate AC for allele count. So you put in your 0.01% um, uh, and you put in your population from Nomad and this gives you your allele count. So a good example here is run six. We had a BRCA1 C.301 uh, plus seven G to A variant with 13 um, alleles on Nomad. So 38% of participants applied PM2 and 26% applied BS1. Hopefully you can all now see that actually neither is applicable, that um, it, 13 is way too high to apply PM2. And um, yeah, we want more than 18 in order to apply BS1. So now moving on to the allelic data. Um, again, I'm going to go through this quite quickly because uh, it's already been covered by Andrew. 
So it's um, not very often used, but there are some circumstances when you can use it, it's actually very useful because you can get up to kind of um, a reasonable strength or we cap it as strong. So it's for recessive disorders where it's detected in trans. So th this would be any of the genes that cause Fanconi's anemia, or you can also use it for ATM variants with ataxia telangiectasia. Um, so we recommend using the SBI guidelines, but we would cap it at strong. With this caveat is that you need to be a little bit cautious at, about inferring the phenotype when it's just present in a heterozygous state if the majority of the observations of it are seen in the biallelic um, or um, um, recessive state. So um, yeah, just be very careful with that. An example where we used PM3 was in RUN7 for this PALB2 variant. Um, this is another one I'm going to skip over and move on to the segregation data. And in actual fact, I didn't even do a slide for BS4 because it's pretty much never used and um, because it would be non-segregation with disease, but we know a breast and ovarian cancer caused by BRCA1, BRCA2, um, HRR genes is, has reduced penetrance. You do see, and then we also have um, phenocopies as well. So it would be very unusual to, to use um, BS4 um, in this case, and it's a strong category as well. So we're just gonna focus on PP1. So this is co-segregation with disease in multiple affected family members. We use the Jarvik and Browning approach, um, which is kind of shown here, the, the figures that you need. And in these circumstances, you would only count the affected relatives with the variant. So if you had an intervening relative who had the variant, but who didn't develop, um, hadn't developed breast cancer, you would not count that relative. And um, although you think it would be very useful in an autosomal dominant disease, actually it can be quite hard to apply because you need at least three informative meioses in one family, each of them with the variant confirmed. And because cancer can be a later onset, it can be tricky. So a good example to demonstrate this, we had in run six, this BRCA1 splice variant. There was this fantastic paper by Garibe et al with all the beautiful pedigrees, which is very rare that you see this. But actually when we look closely at each of these pedigrees, uh, three out of the four were not informative for that segregation um, to affected that had the variant. So we could only use one family and uh, we were only able to apply PP1 at supporting. Okay, so my last grouping, which is the multifactorial data, and this is something that's quite new to uh, the CAMBE guidelines. So this is um, something that we implemented in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene specific guidelines in June last year. And it's a way of using the published multifactorial data from Enigma. So while we're pending the Enigma guidelines being ratified by the ACMG um, and how we could kind of translate um, their results into the ACMG codes. So um, the, yeah, the shown here in the text is how you would say, for example, if you've got a very high likelihood ratio based on segregation, you could apply that under, under PP1. If you had a very low um, negative score, you could apply it under BS, um, BS4 or specificity, specificity familial tumor phenotype, apply under PP4, etc. So, but sometimes where there's evidence in several of the categories and each of them individually doesn't really add up to kind of sig significant points, then you can use the totality of the evidence. And we would recommend applying this within PP5. So obviously I'm aware within um, the ClinGen SBI group, they got rid of the use of PP5 and BP6, the reputable source, because they recommended that you went and got that data and um, specifically, but I think for this circumstance, this is a really good use um, of, of PP5 because you're combining different codes. There are multiple of these multifactorial assays published, and if your variant is in more than one, then we would recommend that you use the most recent publication. And a good example of this is in the RUN6, and we have this BRCA1 C.301 plus 7 G to A variant. It was an Enigma class one, so lots of participants um, classified it as class one, but using the ACMG, we could only get it to class two, likely benign. So this was pre the CAMBIG um, uh, guidelines coming out in June 2021. 
and that we use BS3 strong and we did still use the BP6, but just at the Richards et al kind of default strength of supporting. But now um, you can convert the likelihood ratio and you've got several of these codes that are you know, very high. So and the, the totality of the evidence combined likelihood ratio is minus 32. So you can really see that you've got a huge amount of evidence and that you are able to use um, BP6 at strong and then get that to class one. And then my final two slides is the other um, area we get a lot of questions about and can be a very tricky area is how you combine the codes and which codes you can and can't use together. And Dr. Alice Garrett from the Canvig group has produced this really useful grid, uh, grid that's in the consensus specification, really mapping out each of the codes. So where it's shown in light green is you can use those codes together. Where it's in the light green, uh, the darker green, sorry, with the, the number, you can use them, but there is a caveat that's shown in the, in the table on the right, and those in red are not permitted to be used together. And again, that's all explained on the grid on the right. Uh, and we have exactly the same for the benign codes. So hopefully you'll find this useful when you're classifying your um, variants. And yeah, as Sandy said, please do provide um, us with some feedback. And um, that's it from me. I'm handing back to you, Sandy. Straight to Kathleen. Either, Miranda, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. It's so helpful to see things broken down into little chunks because it's quite overwhelming when you just look at the guidelines and don't really know where to start. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and then moving on, Kathleen, can we come to you now for uh, to try and describe how we use our databases and all the, the multiple databases that are available for us as tools? That yes, would be great. <laughs> Right, yes. So next slide, please. We'll move on. So as um, Miranda and Sandy already told you, I will uh, continue because one of the recurrent questions we received on the previous runs was about databases, which databases can we use? and uh, to deal with them. And this is coming from um, the criteria um, PP5 and uh, BP6, um, where it is said that you can consult reputable sources um, and to, to, to use as a, as a criterion to, uh, as pathogenic at the supporting level or at uh, benign, or benign as a strong of supporting level. But what is a reputable? source. Miranda already hinted towards um, the, the likelihood ratios that have been calculated by Enigma, specifically that for BRCA1 and 2 variants. However, um, we, well, uh, since we have to evaluate variants also outside BRC1 and 2, we need some more uh, guidance. And ACGS have, has detailed this uh, in more detail and have uh, indicated that um, we can use the criteria, well, the, the classifications done by large uh, laboratories who may have large series available uh, of cases that are not publicly available, but which, which allow them to reliably classify uh, the variants. So um, they state that you can use um, the classifications done by uh, two or more uh, accredited North American commercial diagnostic uh, laboratories uh, if they have done it after 2018, um, or if there is um, yeah, uh, one North American commercial diagnostic uh, laboratory where they have uh, cited um, the where that has been cited in the, in the literature, or uh, when there is uh, a ClinGen expert group who has uh, classified uh, the variant. Uh, so where to find this uh, information? Well, the best known database, of course, is uh, ClinPAR. It's um, an active partner of the ClinGen project. So they archive all the results of the recognized uh, expert panels and also of the providers of best uh, practice guideline. However, you should know that ClinPAR does not curate the content and does not modify interpretations. Uh, in independent of an explicit submission. So uh, you have to be careful and sometimes you may have 
evidence available that the classification in ClinVar uh, is not correct and ClinVar then um, motivates you to submit your own data with the evidence uh, supporting your interpretation. To give you uh, an, an idea about the reliability of the classification in ClinVar, they use a four-star rate, uh, four rating system. So if a variant has only one star, this means that there is only a, a single uh, submitter who has uh, submitted this variant and who provided uh, criteria. So for instance, you have here a variant from room seven um, that was submitted by uh, one lab um, and um, yeah, we, you cannot, um, you can, and there were contradictive, um, there were several labs, there were five submissions, however, but there were contradictive interpretations, meaning there were three labs classifying it as uncertain significance and one as uh, benign. So therefore you cannot uh, see it as a reputable source and you cannot apply PP5 or BP6. Uh, um, you can have uh, stars in ClinVar, and this means that there were criteria provided by the submitters. There were multiple submitters, but there were, uh, and there were no uh, conflicts. And the more uh, reliable is when they are coming from an expert panel, because then you will see three, the variant will get three stars. And uh, then there is an expert panel who has done the dissertation panel, it's like uh, Enigma, or for the Lynch genes, it can be uh, inside. And uh, this can be then um, copied. And for instance, in case of this variant, it's a silent variant, was classified by Enigma, uh, you can apply uh, BP6. Um, there are also four stars, however, this is then based on uh, practice guideline assertions, but there are no examples for variants in the BRCA and HRR genes, so I will not further discuss this uh, for the time constraints. Besides ClinVar, there is LOVD, and LOVD is the Leiden, Leiden Open Source Variation uh, Database, and uh, it's an, um, an uh, software that helps to um, collect genomic variants and uh, phenotypes. And the big difference with ClinVar is that it's uh, curated. Um, it show, it allows you to see both a gene-centered view, uh, view, but also patient-centered view. So if you want to have an overview of all variants in a particular patient that was submitted, you can also um, see this. LOVD is open source and uh, they, the, the designers try to actively uh, further improve it and it connects with uh, data resources like GNC, CBI, ABI and Utilizer to make sure that the uh, variant nomenclature is uh, correct. Um, there are several databases available for the genes that are relevant for this um, audience. So you have for BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, uh, PALB2, CHECK2, and you see, you can easily see who are the curators. These can be contacted. However, for some databases, uh, the, there is not yet a curator uh, appointed and there is a, a vacancy. Showing you uh, the variant that I have previously shown for uh, ClinVar, this is how it looks like in, um, in LOVD. So, so you have this missense variant in uh, ATM. Uh, you see uh, how the lab has, uh, or the submitter has classified it. And in, uh, yeah, in some cases you get some phenotype in information for the others is the, that, uh, uh, that they are, it's a sharing initiative from the Netherlands, or you can have labs who um, put their uh, classification criteria uh, so that you can do it, uh, judge uh, for further for yourself. Um, However, so you have ClinVar, you have LOVD. There are also initiatives who are trying to bundle all the information from the different uh, databases, for instance, uh, BRCA Exchange. 
Um, so this is a huge effort to do it for the, for the BRC1 and BRC2 genes. And you see that currently the database counts more than 68,000 uh, variants in any of these two genes, but it's limited to these two genes. So it's only for available for BRC1 and 2 and not for the other uh, genes. Um, they bundle information from multiple databases, which, which gives you uh, immediately a good overview. I will show in uh, some examples in the next slide. And uh, they aim to provide the researcher with researchers with a set of BRCA variations and annotations, which is as comprehensive as uh, possible. And that's uh, an example you can see here. So it's a, a variant Miranda has also discussed. It's a spice variant in uh, BRCA2. You immediately get an overview of the frequencies in, for instance, uh, GNOMAT in the different subpopulations. You immediately get an overview of how it has been classified in ClinVar um, and, and who, who that is, and also uh, who has submitted it to LOVD and their uh, classification. What I particularly like about the BRCA exchange is that they also give an overview of the functional uh, assay results that have been performed. So here for another variant, Miranda has discussed uh, in uh, BRC1. Uh, they, you get an overview of the functional assays that have been evaluated by uh, Enigma and that are considered as um, very well uh, validated. Um, and you immediately get an overview if the uh, functional assay is based, uh, well, evaluate the variant at the RNA level of or at the protein level or uh, at uh, both levels. So for instance, you have here the Findlay assay where you immediately see that um, this variant was um, identified as a loss of function variant. If you click on, on this, you get this overview and you have some more um, detailed uh, information. Miranda already hinted towards um, the, the work that has, has been done by Canvar uh, UK. Um, and this is uh, actually bundling also a lot of, uh, providing an overview of a lot of information. And the big advantage of this uh, database is that it's broader than only BRC1 and uh, 2. Uh, so for instance, um, I'm showing here the results from the same variant as I had shown in back in, for the BRCA exchange um, uh, data. It looks a bit different. Here you have uh, six uh, tabs with, uh, on which you can click and uh, have some information. For instance, in the summary tab, you get this overview. Then um, for the controls and the frequency, you get these data from the GNOMAT population frequencies. Um, you have for the genetic epidemiology, you get the um, uh, likelihood rate issues as published by Parsons et al. And uh, there is also a functional and splicing assay. Um, and and that is, uh, these results are shown here. There is a sixth step. Um, this is, um, well, this is only uh, accessible for people with a login. So having an NIH um, affiliation, and for me, this is not the case, uh, but all the other information and is, uh, is available, except this one is limited to people who, have, uh, who are associated to uh, NIH. Um, here in the overview, they also hint towards two other databases, which I have not yet uh, discussed, is the uh, HGMD and UMD uh, classifications. What are these? Um, well, the UMD BRC1-2 mutation database uh, was initially established by the, the French uh, academic uh, laboratories, um, and it was uh, well, freely accessible until 2015. But the, since then, they have um, well, they have more uh, commercialized it, and um, access is uh, behind. Uh, well, you have to to uh, sign in for uh, for a license. 
Um, so it, this is, well, this is uh, less accessible uh, today. And the same counts for HGMD. So until 2015, um, it was freely accessible and it's, uh, it's an it attempts to collate all the known published gene lesions responsible for human inherited disease. So this was not coming from one or a group of labs. This was really uh, published uh, data. Um, but uh, since uh, it, it's now you also need a uh, commercial license to get access to the HMD professional uh, database. So I would like to end here and hand over the microphone back to Sandy and Simon for the Q&A uh, session. Fantastic. Thank you, Kathleen, very much indeed. What a great compliment, the three webinars together. The presentations have really been a very comprehensive overview and huge educational value. So thank you very much indeed. Um, next slide, please. So just before we move on to the, the Q&A session and I hand over to Simon, um, can we just move on to the next slide, please? I just want to flag that currently the um, BRCA1, BRCA2 and HRR gene variant RUN8 is now open. Um, it's available until the end of this month. That's the 30th of June. So if you've not yet registered for the online individual assessment, then please do so. And here is the link. Um, we will be able to um, hold a webinar in the middle of July following up from the results and sort of the expert panel giving you feedback on the variants in this EQA run. So really please do participate to get as much benefit from your learning today as well. Um, if you have any problems or want some further information, then please contact either the EMQN office or the GenQA office. Thank you very much indeed. So Simon, over to you for a q and I see we've got quite a stream of questions coming in and I'm sure we can cover a few in the next few minutes. All right, thank you, Sandy, very much indeed. And thank you to Andrew, Miranda and Kathleen as well. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in already, which I can see that the team have actually been uh, answering in as we go through. Given the timing, we haven't got time for very many, but we've got a couple of questions here that um, we've queued up for you already. So we're gonna kick off um, for a question uh, for Miranda, um, which is, do you consider Finley et al as a standalone assay? And if you do, can you use PS3 in this case if you only have Finley et al data? Thank you. Um, so a, one of the principles of the ACMG guidelines was that you always had to have two pieces of evidence. So the only standalone code you can um, it, there is, is the BA1. So you would need a second piece of evidence. And I think this is especially important when you've got this functional data, because, because they did such a big multiplex assay using the saturation genome editing for every possible position. There are lots of those variants that have actually never been seen in a cancer the case. So we've got the functional data, but we don't really have the data from, you know, bio, you know, real people to know that it causes cancer. So I think it's really important that we um, have another, have another criteria you use. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Miranda. So while you're on, the, while you're on this question, stream of questions coming in, I've got one more for you. Okay. Um, so um, do you use co-segregation PP1? or the in-trans PM3 criteria when the variant has been, identif has been identified in a patient with other phenotypes different from cancer? Uh, very, very cautiously, I would, I would say. Um, so yeah, we know that there are hypomorphic variants that can be present in patients with Fanconi's. Um, and so, you, I certainly wouldn't use PP1. PP1 has to be for a cancer phenotype. I think you probably would use PM3 cautiously if there are kind of other cases or other evidence. If that was the only case and say you were testing an unaffected person, um, I, I, would be, I would be extremely cautious about, about using that. Okay, so um, we've probably got time for one, maybe two more questions. And I can see that we have two questions to go. So that's very handy. Uh, that wasn't scripted, I can assure you. Um, so can we use RNA sequencing analysis to reclassify variants? So if an intronic variant causes a splice alteration, can I use PVS1 decision trees? Anybody like to take that question up? 
Oh, that's a very good question. I, I do think we're waiting on some guidance from the, uh, and I believe there's a ClinGen working group looking at RNA. Oh, I apologize, I forgot to turn on the video. Um, I believe there is a ClinGen working group looking at RNA-seq or RNA and splicing. Uh, at the moment, I would probably feel most comfortable using this as functional evidence. Right, so yeah, I think some of the research is starting to use PVS1 underscore O for observed, but um, again, that's coming with the next version of the ACMG. So at the moment, we're still using it under PS3. I think that will change. Okay, so that so so there's definitely guidance coming on that very shortly is what you're trying to say, and it's, and it's it's certainly going to be incorporated into classification at some stage in the near future. I don't know how near, but well, sometime, <laughs> I don't yeah. think we'll get the ACMG <laughs> new guidelines this year, but um, maybe the uh, the splicing SBI. Okay, right. So we finished off with one last question, throwing open to the audience to the to the panel as well. So um, PP five. Uh, uh, this is quite a complex question, but greater than two accredited North American U.S. laboratories classif uh, classify class four, class five applies with two stars, but the literature cited in ClinVar by the submitters refers to a similar variant. The question is, can PP5 be used for this variant in question? Uh, maybe I, I can take that. Um, well, it says the question is it's a similar variant. So then I would rather check if you cannot apply uh, the PS1 because this is about a variant in the same amino acid and then a bit dependent on um, if, if it's really leading to the same amino acid change. You can check if you can uh, use PS1 or not. And if uh, P well, and, and if PS3 uh, about the functional assay can be can be applied. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Right, so that probably brings it to uh, a conclusion for the questions and answers. We have all the questions uh, available to us on our Q and A, so we will collate that, that information for you and make it available. I suspect probably on the on the on the, the on the. Um, the scheme report after the assessment process is concluded. Um, as Sandy quite uh, outlined, we, the, the, the actual variance assessment run is still open and we'll, we'll, we'll close towards the end of the month. So if you have not registered, please make sure you do so as soon as you can, so you can join us in that assessment process. Um, we have another webinar, as I said, end of uh, middle of July to feedback on it. So it only draws, it only leaves me to thank our um, expert panel uh, to Kathleen, Miranda and Andrew for uh, their amazing talk. It was a really good and hopefully very informative uh, webinar for you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get back to us via, via the AZ team uh, or the EMQN or GenQA offices. Uh, I'm sure you all have the email address. And um, with that, I think we'd like to wrap up and conclude. And thank you once again for joining us for our webinar today. Thank you very much indeed and good afternoon.